Welcome to the Inside Lane here on Sports 360 AZ. I'm your host, Devin Henry, getting ready for NASCAR Championship Weekend, November 6th, 7th, and 8th at Phoenix Raceway. And the battle continues to heat on up and probably one, one of the most fun battles, maybe the most fun battle in all three NASCAR series, has to be the Xfinity Series. And join us today on the Inside Lane. He is the 2008 Arca Menard Series Champion a four-time Chili Bowl A main qualifier, and a 14-time winner in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. Driver of the Junior Motorsports number 7 Chevy Camaro from Riverton, Illinois, it's Justin Hallgeier. Justin, thanks for joining me. Absolutely, man. Glad to be on, and uh, it's always good getting an introduction like that. It's, it, it never gets old, I can assure you of that. Well, hey, your resume is pretty fun. I want to talk a little bit about your dirt racing background a little bit later. You've been running the Chili Bowl since, I mean, I, I don't even know what I was doing as a young teenager. And I think, what, at 14, you're going and running the Chili Bowl Nationals and going out and succeeding there. So I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about your dirt racing. But first and foremost, NASCAR round of eight. I know Kansas was a tough one here. But now what needs to happen in the coming weeks to try to make the championship four at Phoenix? Well, Kansas was definitely a tough one. Uh, but, you know, the, the good thing about racing is there's – there's always the next week and, and, you know, we, we've got a, another great opportunity to go. We got two more races, obviously, before uh, we lock our way into hopefully the top four at, at Phoenix uh, in a few weeks. So, you know, I think the goal for us is just go out. We've, we've done a good job all summer long. Uh, we had a good amount of points to kind of rely on. So we need to go and, and kind of um, use that to our advantage, right? Use those points to our advantage. We're, we're still above the cut line by, by a decent margin. It could always be better. We could be locked in and not have to worry about it, but uh, still have a decent margin. And we got two good racetracks for us. You know, we led a ton of laps in the spring at, at uh, I guess the summer, I should say at Texas. Um, I made a blend line violation, which was an interesting situation because we had, we had uh, done that kind of regularly we had we had kind of used that that same route regularly and and finally got called on it and it was probably the one day that we had the most dominant car so i was disappointed so we had a good race in the in the summer and then obviously martinsville is going to be a, a little bit of a wild card i don't think anybody knows what to expect with the xfinity series going back there for the first time in a number of years um especially considering there's no practice i mean we're literally gonna line up and go race and so i think that's going to be interesting but you know if we do make it to phoenix uh, as one of those final four competitors i think we got a great shot at, at going to victory lane and obviously if you go to victory lane and you're in that final four at, at phoenix you're going to become the champions that would be a pretty pretty special uh pretty special end of this season for us and you know a thing or two about visiting that very fun victory lane at phoenix raceway you did so last november right now you are 11 points above the cut line three wins this year but uh, most importantly, some would say, is the two wins at Phoenix Raceway. Obviously, you have to get there first. But if you are in the championship four, what did you learn last November that you might be able to take into the championship four on November 7th if you're in that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, Phoenix is one of those racetracks that is, is extremely difficult, uh, but a lot of fun and very rewarding when your car is good. And, and the thing that I really enjoy is the fact that we, we had a great car there last, last fall. Obviously, we were able to go to victory lane. We dominated the race here in the spring, and uh, unfortunately, you know, we 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 played a gamble on a, on a late race strategy call. We we really thought that the race was going to have some cautions in it, and so we wanted to save that last set of tires. And, and unfortunately, the caution just never fell, and we had to kind of limp our way home to a finish. And it wasn't the ideal situation. We still finished decent. It was still a good day for all intents and purposes, but. Uh, we had the fastest car. So, you know, I look at, at those two things and say, well, if you're looking at, at setups and, and, you know, having that to lean on, I think we got a great shot at and going there and, and, and having a good day. Now, that being said, you already mentioned it. Um, you have to be in. If you're not in that final four, nothing else really matters. It's not going to matter if you win the race. It's not going to matter if you have the best car. Um, it's not going to matter if you make a mistake or you don't. You're not going to have that shot of going for a championship. So I think we got to do our job uh, these next two weeks and, and put ourselves in great position for Phoenix. The Desert Diamond West Valley Casino 200 on November 7th to crown the NASCAR Xfinity Series champion. I do want to talk a little bit about you, though, and your background. It seems like more and more drivers come from some sort of dirt routes. I mean, typically you guys get, you know, it's, it's go-karters who advance into stock cars or late models on the payment side, and then you keep on moving up. But then you got guys like Kyle Larson, Chase Briscoe, Christopher Bell, so many dirt guys, including yourself. Now, you don't get to run on the dirt very often, but you still like to get muddy from time to time. 
But when it comes to that experience kind of coming up NASCAR, how important do you think it is to have that dirt heritage for some of these young drivers trying to come up through the NASCAR ranks? Well, I tell people all the time, you know, I think the one thing that I love about dirt is the fact that it gives you such a well-rounded um, arsenal of tools, right? You, you race on racetracks that are heavy and maybe have a big cushion or they're rough, um, have a lot of grip. Sometimes you get on a really slick racetrack that has, absolutely no grip and you feel like you're driving on ice you know there's so many scenarios that you put yourself into on a regular basis and sometimes in in one single night you go from one to the other and i think that that's what makes the dirt guys um makes the transition a little bit easier if i if i could say it that way i don't know that it makes them any better um it just makes the transition easier which i think is in turn why you see more guys um, that are successful on dirt, make the transition over because it, it makes that, that transition a little more seamless. Um, you know, obviously NASCAR is its own unique animal, right? There's so many things that are different about um, all three series of NASCAR or all, all, I guess what all five series or six series, whatever it is now, if you include the, the ARCA series, but you know, the three top series, there, there's so many things that make them unique, even amongst themselves. You know, the truck series is so much different than the Xfinity series. And obviously the Xfinity series is different than the cup and the truck series. So, you know, I think the dirt guys just have that natural ability to adapt because that's what we're used to doing. Whereas I think a lot of, a lot of times when you uh, grow up racing pavement, you tend to hit your marks really well. And I would say that those guys um, are extremely quick. They, they, they're able to maximize the amount of grip for, for, you know, um, a lap or, or in the conditions that suit them really well. Uh, but then, you know, a lot of times the conditions change over the course of a race and it takes a dirt guy to kind of adapt to it. So one of my favorite things about you inside the cockpit happens to be your helmet. And yes, I saw the Saguaros on there. It's a gorgeous looking helmet. And a lot of people don't know this. It's designed by the world renowned graphic artist, the seven year old Harper Allgaier. I mean, I know that you have a graphic design background, but how in the world did she get into designing helmets and how did she get so good at it? Well, the second question there, how she got so good at it, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I, absolutely incredible. You know, first of all, I need to give a big thank you to not only my daughter for, for painting my helmet and designing it, but um, my wife, who was who originally kind of the, the originator of this whole idea. And then uh, the guys that paint my helmets normally, um, off axis paint, uh, Greg and the guys over there. When my wife went to him with this idea the first time, my daughter was three. She said, hey, I'd love to let Harper like, put her handprints on the back of a helmet or, you know, do something special and we'll give Justin this helmet for, for the playoffs. And the, the idea kind of, uh, they ran with the ball and, and my wife was so nervous because uh, there was a lot of finger painting going on and she knows that my helmets are, you know, super important to me. I, I love the design aspect of it because of my background. And, and so she told me, she said, I, I don't, after she gave it to me, she's like, I, if, if you don't like it, I, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't mean for it. And I was like, no, I love it. You know, the fact that my daughter literally put her hands into it, right? I mean, that's, that's literally her, her putting her hands in the paint and putting on the helmet. Like it just was really cool. Well, since then, obviously she's gotten older, you know, the, the old age of seven, uh, seeing the amount of, of transition that she's made into what what it's become is just truly incredible I, I i can't even begin to describe to folks when they look at my helmets and they say oh the, that's really cool that your daughter designed it i'm like no no she designed it and painted it like she literally airbrushed it and painted it and and you know my uh greg was telling me that that he's like the first couple years we rigged the airbrush up so that she could kind of make do and he's like now she just grabs the airbrush and she starts painting and and it's it's really special. Um, not only as a dad to see your kid do something that's, that's that neat, but as a racer that, you know, we put a lot of heart and soul into uh, what we do on the racetrack, but you know, this is a family sport and, and without them being by my side, um, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. And, and so, uh, you know, to have that little piece of my family uh, riding in the car with me means a lot more too. And Harper's ready for the championship for too. She has that Phoenix Raceway logo Saguaro all over it. So I think that you have some high expectations uh, from your helmet designer along with that. Uh, I do, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think she'll probably want to be in victory lane. I know it's tough right now uh, with the coronavirus. It's changed everyone's life. And NASCAR being the first sport to really go back and I mean, more so than in full force when you guys first started returning to racing back in May. But as a husband and as a father, what has the most difficult part of the past few months been for you? Well, you know, I think 
number one, the non-traveling part for, for my family, you know, like I said, it's a family sport and, and they're with me all the time. And, and so since coronavirus, they've not been able to travel to the racetrack and they've not been able to come and be there and be a part of it. So that's been extremely difficult. On the other hand, um, I think the social aspect of it, you know, watching her, um, watching her kind of blossom, uh, as she's gotten older and, and see, you know, her, social tendencies and she's always been really shy. So to see her kind of open up and, and in the spring, you know, seeing her um, at school and like how social she was becoming and then to kind of have that all taken away and, and we all go into seclusion and, and, you know, it's not just us, it's everybody, but you know, a lot of people don't look at, yes, this, this virus is obviously extremely tough and, and dangerous, but um, I think it, it goes further more than even just the, the staying away from people. I, you know, it's, it's hard because the social aspect of it for, for kids is, is going to be the part that I, I really think we're going to see the effects of for, for a long time. And, and that's disappointing because um, like I said, I, I felt like my daughter was really kind of coming into her own and, and getting that personality that we were looking for and, 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 you know, hoping that she would find and she found it and she was doing great. And, and then you see this time of, of being kind of, you know, in quarantine and how much it, it takes back and, and how hard it is now to kind of reacclimate to, to what is normal. And, and I think, you know, as an adult, nobody likes what's going on, right? Nobody, nobody wants to be stuck in their house and nobody wants to be social distancing and doing all those things. But I think as an adult, you, you tend to have the ability to be able to understand that. Whereas as a, as a child, I think a lot of times you don't necessarily have that ability to understand what's going on. And, and so it's hard to formulate your own, you know, uh, ideas as to what you need to do to, to kind of take care of yourself. And so I think that's been the toughest part. Uh, but, you know, hopefully we come out of this soon. Um, you know, that'd be the ideal situation. We were able to get back to, um, I think it'll be a little bit different than normal um, than, than whenever we do go back, but try to get back to somewhat normal and hopefully uh, things work out. Talking with Justin Allgaier here on the inside lane, driver of the Junior Motorsports number no. 7 Chevy Camaro in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. Before I let you go, Justin, got to do a segment I do with every driver. It's called Quick Time. Got some rapid fire questions for you. Looking for some answers in return. You ready to set Quick Time? Yeah, I'm ready. All righty. First and foremost, your favorite track to race at, regardless of the car, pavement, dirt, don't care. Um, Honestly, right now it's Road America. Um, I, I love Bristol. Bristol's always my go-to, but but right now I'm digging on Road America. Going for the road course there. Why why specifically Road America? That's an interesting choice. I you know it's just the atmosphere there is so cool and and uh, I don't know. I just I I've, I've fallen in love with that racetrack over the last couple of years and it's definitely one of my favorites. So now I do got I got to talk cars with you. You have a gorgeous 1972 Chevy pickup and it has a phenomenal backstory as well. Is there any other dream cars that you would like to own in the future all of them uh yeah i'm a car guy so i love cars um you know i, I think uh i'd like to do something i'd like to build something you know whether that be a modern car you know i'm, I'm kind of really uh I, I like the the late 2000s or mid to late 2000s corvettes I, i've really fallen in love with those cars so i'd like to build maybe one of those at some point um but you know I, i'd like to build something that's uh kind of over the top, I guess, if you will. So at some point, maybe in my life, I'll be able to do that. But uh, right now, I'm just driving my Silverado pickup truck and have some fun with it. Hey, over the top is the only way to do it. I actually built my 2006 Chevy Silverado with my dad. So I, building cars is fun, but some of the modern ones, they're, just, uh, they're, they're a little tough. They're too many new parts. Too much yes. science. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And last thing for you, if you do have the opportunity to race for a championship in Phoenix on November 7th, what do you think will be the biggest hurdle to overcome that weekend? <sighs> Not making mistakes. You know, I think it's going to be a battle of attrition all the way to the end. I think you're going to have a lot of guys pushing for all they've got. You know, obviously it's a championship on the line, and it's such a difficult racetrack um, to kind of manage on your own, let alone in traffic. So I think just – managing the race well and not making mistakes is going to be the key so hopefully we can do that hopefully we can be in that final four and we got a shot at the championship well justin that is the hope hopefully you will be racing for a championship here at phoenix raceway in the desert diamond 200 on november 7th hope to see you there best of luck this season and appreciate your time yeah thanks bud appreciate it this is the inside lane on sports 360 az be sure to follow along until nascar championship weekend we have all your updates coming up for november 6th 7th and 8th